I'm Tom Long, and today uh, we're going to talk about what is possibly the most blessed road trip in the history of humankind. Why don't you join me? Last spring, my cousin's son graduated from college and was looking for work. Day after day, I prayed that he would find his calling. Then one morning in the middle of that prayer, I suddenly realized that I was praying amiss. Would I have been as prepared to serve the church if I hadn't first been a stable boy, a gas rouster, a farmhand, a stick man for my dad when he was surveying, or worked on cleaning and maintaining equipment in a foundry? From that sudden awareness, my prayer changed from wanting Tyler to immediately settle into whatever the situation would be to which God would call him, to guiding and protecting him on his journey to that calling. Although it had nothing to do with my eyeballs, when I sat down to pray, I had one idea in my head. By the time I stood up, I recognized, I saw that God was working in a different way. So I think I've had a taste of what two people, Cleopas and a friend or his wife, Cleopas and a companion, experienced on the road to Emmaus. It was over. Explaining to a stranger they met on their seven mile hike why it was that they were so downcast, they said he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. But their government and their religious establishment had killed him by crucifixion. They expressed their disappointment because they had believed he was the one who was going to set Israel free from Roman dominion. On top of which, the reports had come in that the body was missing. So Cleopas and his companion were headed back to Emmaus to lick their wounds and get on with their lives. What a sad story this would be if this were how it ended. But it was their good fortune that the man who had come up on them was a rabbi unlike any other. He worked right through the writings of Moses and the prophets and explained to them what the correct way of understanding what the scriptures teach about the Messiah, the anointed one, what the correct way of understanding was. The Messiah had to die to be sacrificed for the sins, not just of Israel, but for the people of the world. This was a liberation even greater than being liberated from Egypt and even greater than being liberated from Rome would have been. This was liberation from being disconnected from God and the life each of us was created to experience. When they reached their little village, the stranger continued on like he would travel further, but they invited him to stay for dinner and resume his journey when it was day. It wasn't until he repeated what he had done with his disciples before his betrayal at that last supper, he did then what he did now with them. He took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And the Bible says, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. Like my prayers for Tyler, they were so convinced they were thinking rightly about the Messiah, they couldn't see the Messiah literally in front of their face. But after their walking and talking with Jesus on the road to Emmaus, after Jesus explained to them the scriptures, after Jesus broke bread with them as he had at the Last Supper, they could recognize Jesus for who he was rather than who they expected him to be. They looked at each other. The Bible doesn't record it, but I imagine they looked at each other and said, Dude! The Bible does say that they asked each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? This was a story too good to keep to themselves. They returned, the Bible says, at once to Jerusalem and shared what had happened to the others. What preconceptions might we have? What expectations might we have that would keep us from meeting the Jesus, not of our culture, 
but the Jesus of the Bible. Keep your eyes open for him, but be warned, he just might set your heart on fire.